All right, hello everyone. With everything going on in the world today, our social activities have to be minimized. I thought it'd be nice to just do a live reading for everybody. Eventually I'll have my entire book of life wisdom in audio format on SoundCloud in order. But for today, I'm gonna to jump ahead to chapter two, a chapter that's relevant to what's going on with everybody right now. And that's the chapter on pandemic prep and survival. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to say that anybody out there that likes to do film editing, I'm always open to doing uh, some resource trading. I would like some more edited videos over time, but I'm also a big fan of just doing a personal coffee shop, bookstore type live stream, rough edges, me stuttering, all that good fun stuff. So with that said, let's put on our blue blockers. Let's do some reading. Let's start with chapter two today, pandemic prep. Chapter two, being prepared for chaos. It's something that you should consider a daily priority if you want to live comfortably during a pandemic. In some instances, chaos may explode with only minutes notice, while others may give you weeks of warning. For example, a meteor can be discovered in weeks in advance, but predicting the affected area will cause more damage than the meteor itself. Predicting a target zone in advance would cause mass panic and extreme chaos. The pandemonium from fear would shut down crucial life-bearing systems before the damage from the actual meteor. For this reason, the media would never predict the location of a large meteor strike until the last 24 hours. Only the highest people on the pyramid would ever be notified any sooner. The highest probability for pandemic belongs to the biological sector. It's happened many times over recorded history, and it will continue to happen more and more often with the damage being caused to our climate by the human species. One positive thing about a biological pandemic is that most of the world will have plenty of notice to increase their preparations at a safe and calm rate. I recommend watching the Netflix documentary called Pandemic to help you understand what happens during an outbreak. The purpose of this chapter is to share how I prepare and live comfortably through these biological pandemics. Some viruses may spread from person to person through pathogens attached to water droplets. This means it can spread faster and further than imaginable through numerous avenues. The initial strain can be created by the bacteria of two different life forms combining to create a new unknown virus with no working cure. Bats are one of the leading carriers of bacteria. Bats could simply drop their bacteria over produce or seafood at a market, but once that bacteria-infested food is eaten or even touched, the next person or animal in contact begins to mix their bacteria with the other two, and before we know it, a superflu type of virus is being spread. It spreads fast, and may even spread silently with long delays in symptoms. The region where it spreads may just think that it is a common strain. It usually takes weeks of testing to realize it has unique symptoms that cannot be cured with existing medicine. By the time local experts declare the new virus, it will be too late to contain it in that region. Anything that can be spread by breath and infected droplets on a surface will spread similar to a wildfire. People will touch the virus infected droplets and will attach to their body. The droplets then transfer to ports of entry and later enter the bloodstream to multiply. You itch your nose and eyes every few minutes on average. You often touch your mouth or you touch a glass and then you touch that glass to your mouth. A list of how droplets transfer would be several pages long. The further an area is from the origination, the longer people there will have to prepare. Unfortunately, the disease will travel fast on airplanes, and you will not have very long. Large transporters, like planes and boats, will breed the virus to most of the people on board. 
to minimize the risk of exposure you have to wash your hands after every time you touch something at risk of being infected. You need to spray disinfectant on anything in question. You need to have disinfectant wipes for things that you don't want to spray or wash. You need a sanitizing gel for situations where you're not near running water and soap. If you have facial hair and you refuse to shave it off while in an infected area, you may want to rub sanitizer through it often. You'll also want to put triple antibiotic gel in your nostrils to kill infected spores as they enter. You don't need to change that much about the way you live. You just need to help remind everyone you know to follow these basic hygiene rules. One of the biggest changes will be your actions around others with weak immune systems. You'll need to sanitize your items and hands before entering the personal space of others with high risk. You'll also want to drink plenty of electrolytes and take a variety of the immune boosters I discuss in the health section of my book. And don't forget to increase your fitness activities and wellness practices. When you notice someone questionably ill, avoid them. You can still go out in public, but use common sense as noted above. As shown in previous pandemics, most every public event and venue would need to be closed for about four weeks to allow the spread to be quarantined. Even those of us who do our best to avoid infection will still have to stay away from public places. No going to work, school, stores, church, concerts, other similar type public places for a few weeks to allow the healthcare facilities time to process the increased traffic of people in critical condition. These public events expose too many people to the virus in tight quarters and many hot zones are traced back to them. People already with illness or immune diseases along with the very young and the elderly may not be able to cope with the respiratory systems on their own. They'll need to occupy a medical bed and breathing machine. If they're too ill to eat or breathe on their own, they'll need IV drops full of nutrients. Care facilities will be overwhelmed because there will not be a cure for a vaccine for a long time and patients will be continuously cycled in and out of emergency rooms and intensive care units. In locations where there are not enough care facilities, people will be left in their beds praying for home visits. In many cases, these people will be transferred to large facilities and forcefully quarantined from any outside contact. Entrances will be guarded and sealed. People will be examined for systems, symptoms and possibly segregated from loved ones by force. People near death will be removed from the machines before they take their last breath. The shortage of machines will require it has to be this way to allow a higher probability of recovery for those in the early stages of the disease. Just think back to all the Nazi videos and stories you're familiar with. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's the reality of a biological pandemic. Tests will be too sparse at first, and the lack of people being able to test it will obscure the true numbers of those infected. This will contribute to the improbability of accurate data to assist in the fight for a cure. How do you prepare? This book is full of advice on how to be prepared for a pandemic. Some basic rules of thumb include the following. Keep crucial life dependent items stockpiled. I keep two months worth of non-perishable items, but you stock what makes you comfortable. Keep a log of your family's use of crucial goods to give you an accurate read of how much you need. Try to minimize your use as much as you can. Change your habits on the use of certain items. If you cannot create or make an item, find a substitute you can rely on. The earliest civilizations replaced toilet paper with bidets and cloth a long time ago. The cloth is easily rinsed and disinfected in a bathtub. Disposable baby diapers should have never been invented. 
They're one of the largest and smallest polluters of our planet. A cloth diaper did just fine for thousands of years. Stop using plastic items and plastic packaging. Shop at stores that promote bulk bin products instead of packaged items. When manufacturers see more sales at bin-based stores, they'll change their production habits and we can reverse this trend. Rainwater should be collected, boiled, filtered, and stockpiled. Every time I see a person with a plastic bottle, I want to slap it out of their hand and give them a reusable bottle from Pathwater. Establish a sustainable shelter. An old camper can be found for around $1,000. This is crucial to have available in case of a long-term economy collapse, or even if the public utilities fail. If you rent your current shelter, you may be evicted during a pandemic because the government may not financially protect you. You need to be prepared to protect yourself. You can do this by having a camper full of survival gear and rations ready. A renewable energy system with a 24-hour capacity can be set up for under $2,000. Watch my YouTube videos. I have a system that explains how you can set one up. You can quickly transfer it from your house to the camper if the time comes. Grow your own food, for goodness sakes. I have a massive garden that generates enough for me to eat during the growing season. And I have a greenhouse plan in place for an emergency source of winter food if, if I need it. I also have a large producing plants in pots that can be transferred if I need to go mobile. Learn to make money online. I have a long section in Life Wisdom that addresses this. And learn to invest or save up critical items that hold a high barter value as well. Let's talk about beyond the preparation. How about during, during the pandemic and surviving during the pandemic? Minimizing is important. Minimizing is one of the most overlooked secrets to a happy life. Decreasing the amount of stuff surrounding you will increase your health and ability to contribute to your community. We all enjoy the rewards of our toys, but they eventually distract us and increase our stress and anxiety. One of the best things you can do is take up a bunch of items laying around and put them in storage totes and keep them out of sight. The less items you see every day, the less stress you will have from them. I rotate items that I rarely use every few months in and out of my closets. Minimizing the things in your life is not the only action you should take towards simplifying, though. There's other steps. Try living sustainably with zero waste. Life as a minimalist means living with as little impact as possible. There are hundreds of tips I could list to help you use less in your life, but most of them are very obvious. I'll tell you some of my favorites. Let's begin with the necessities of life, starting with the air we breathe. Surrounding yourself with plants in your home minimizes the need for air purifier products and medication for breathing-related conditions. They also provide food, which reduces your need to use products from a store. Your next biggest need is water. If you're not already collecting your own well, or rain, or spring water, what are you waiting for? City water in most areas is filled with chemicals that have been previously dumped into the gray water. Pharmaceuticals and cleaners get flushed down toilets, and vehicle fluids spill down the sewer collectors. Then more chemicals are used to treat those chemicals and the purification plants. The only way to stop the spreading of cancers from mistreated water is to stop drinking it. A large amount of the medicine doctors prescribe contain fluoride, which is a known neurotoxin that lowers IQ. The fluoride in drinking water lowers IQ by about 7 points when exposed repeatedly over years prior to age 14. That was almost half a standard deviation according to a Harvard study. Bottled water isn't much better. 
It's stored in plastic that leaks carcinogens into the water as they sit on shelves. If they're stored in sunlight or extreme temperatures, the chemicals are released from the plastic bond even quicker. Another big reason to not support the bottled water industry is that the plastic contributes to the world's pollution. The majority of the studies say that less than 15% of plastic bottles make it back to a recycling facility. If you live in a dry region, you should take five gallon containers to refill stations and then fill up your stations. Anytime you see someone with a small plastic bottle of water, give them a note with the title of my book. Tell them if they contact us, we'll give them a free copy of the book to help and enlighten them on the damages they're contributing to. We provide biodegradable Tetra Pak containers of water and aluminum path water bottles, bottles locally here at our Hawkins Living Center location. Let's talk about your shelter. Calculate how much space you need and why. List the rooms in your dwelling and their uses. Now cut that in half and start designing your new home. Oversized, overpriced property mortgages are the most powerful weapon by governments to enslave citizenship. A lifetime of debt and all the extra work to obtain income to pay for such debt is a perfect case study for countries like the U.S., which are on the path to implosion. The typical home can be built using your surrounding materials for under 15 grand. If you learn to do the labor, the only money you need to spend on is materials. You can even find a lot of materials in a local dump or free on Craigslist and similar online sources. In fact, the bulk of your spending should be for the property you want to live on and the foundation. Read all about the tiny home movement and prepare to be amazed at how millions are living in homes under a thousand square foot. One of the best series of videos out there can be found by searching YouTube for Quail Springs Permaculture. Uh, another friend I like to follow has a channel called Cabin Land. I also suggest you watch Geoff Lawton's videos and some van life videos. Don't pay utility bills. Connect sleeping rooms and cold climates with the kitchen and use solar and geothermal heating sources. Heat from cooking can be channeled in areas of your home that need it. I spent a lot of my time in a single room camper with a wood pellet or oil burning stove that I also cook on. For cooking that requires a specific temperature, I use a convection burner. The consistency of the temperature depends on the quality of the pan. Thinner steel cannot maintain a constant temperature as well as a cast iron, so you may experience a fluctuation from time to time. I recycle all my trash, and I usually don't pay for trash service. When I'm staying in a few small East Texas communities, they partner with waste disposal companies here, and they charge around a $15 mandatory monthly fee on their water bills. I'm currently growing a petition against this practice. Contact me for the current link if you'd like to sign the petition and show your support. You should just burn as much of your non-recyclable trash as possible. The organic ash can be combined into your garden compost. I try not to purchase products and packaging that cannot be reused or recycled. I reuse everything possible multiple times. I gain rainwater, filter it, and refill my glass containers. Remember, if you purchase non-biodegradable plastic water bottle products, you're contributing to the destruction of the ocean wildlife and the beaches. I like to use Brita products because they provide drop centers at Whole Food Markets and other places with free shipping labels to return their used filters for recycling. I use washable hemp-based clothes for most of my cleaning needs and nose blowing. When I find abandoned cloths, I use them as oil rags and vehicle cleaning cloths until they are too greasy to wash and then use them to start fires. When I relocate to new homes during help projects, I look around at the items they dispose of. I'm often able to use the items for many of my needs. For example, most people buy products that come in containers that are great for starter pots for my plants. I use what they view as trash and fill them up with compost and seeds. 
Reuse your water. Rainwater can be collected in solar shower barrels and then drained into more collectors or piped directly into gardens. A large water tank can be filled with rainwater and plumbed into a sink easily. It can then be used for laundry and other home uses before it being drained into the garden. Hand washing and line drying are not very difficult and they can make a big savings on your electric bill. Make your own healthcare products. Check out what my friends make at moonrivernaturals.com. Make your own clothing. Learn to weave hemp fiber. I like to support hemp rope sandals designed similar to those made by Nomadic State of Mind. Varieties of hemp have been the world's main source of fiber materials since the beginning of recorded history. I could write a whole book about hemp, but it's already been done by Jack Herrick. I grow the Canaf variety here in our community garden. It absorbs carbon dioxide faster per plant than most any other plant or tree on the planet. It is edible and can be used for everything that hemp can be used for without the concern looks by visitors. Even though growing non-THC medicinal hemp strains are completely legal anyway. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Think green and imagine that you are in a secluded area like Alaska and try to live like it. Your friends and family will learn from your example and you can teach them how to make the switch and help extend the Earth's ability to provide a healthier atmosphere for human life. Together we can heal the planet and get back on the healing side of the point of no return while still living comfortably during difficult times. In addition to this preparation wisdom, You'll find more survival details on renewable energy solutions, health care, home remedies, food nutrition, and much more in my later chapters of Life Wisdom. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to uh, continuing our conversation in the comments or other social media. So please remember to subscribe, comment, share. Until we meet again, stay well and be blessed.